It's easy to look at the state of our world and be so overwhelmed by hopelessness that you almost become paralysed from being able to take action. What difference would it make? And where do you even start? The answer has to be, start somewhere. Anywhere. As an Australian, the reality is it is difficult to relate, comprehend, understand the refugee crisis. We're so far away, we are incredibly lucky. And we have the privilege of being able to look away or change the channel when things get too horrible. However, just because we can doesn't mean we should. We are currently living through the biggest humanitarian crisis that has ever been recorded. In June 2016, the number of people displaced by war, civil unrest and persecution eclipsed that of World War II. At the end of last year, over 68.5 million people were displaced globally, which is greater than the entire population of Australia, New Zealand and Canada combined. I first travelled to the Greek island of Chios, which is just seven kilometres from the Turkish coast, with a great friend of mine in 2016. And at the time, I had a lot of people asking me, are you sure? Is it safe? Why? I saw the picture of Aylan Kurdi, the little three-year-old boy, who, along with his five-year-old brother Gallup and their mother Rehan, drowned trying to make the trip to Europe to safety. You'll all remember the image of him being found washed up on the beach. No three-year-old should ever lose their life like that. And that picture should never represent a situation that so many people are facing in our lifetime. It's an image that shocked the world, yet three years later, nothing's changed. There's an amazingly powerful poem by Warsan Shire, a Somali British poet, who wrote, you have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land and no one chooses refugee camps. There's a lot about my time in Kiosk that I will never forget, and one of those moments is the first time that Tim and I walked into the Suda refugee camp. I was a bit apprehensive, I really didn't know what to expect. So I'd like you to all do me a favour and close your eyes for a minute, and just think about what images come into your mind when I say the word refugee. Now open your eyes. This is Shadi, a four-year-old Alibaba who stole my heart and, like so many four-year-olds, my phone. <laughs> and so this is Suda through his eyes. In the camps, the conditions are hellish and things are only getting worse. Some days there's no electricity, some days no safety, some days no water, and on a bad day, all three are lacking. The food is appalling, and no one should be forced to live in conditions like this in 2018. But there can't be dark without light, and like so often happens in life, it was the children who were largely responsible for bringing the light to Suda. They brought out the best in the adults, who all tried to make it a better place for them. Coming together each day to sing and dance, read and colour in, play and paint our nails. One of the things that surprised me, probably naively, was that straight away and every day, I would meet someone who reminded me of my friends and my family back home. With each day and each conversation, differences faded and similarities grew stronger. These are not people to be feared. It's not their war and they certainly were not born to live this life. I met surgeons and fashion designers for DKNY, electricians, engineers, builders, everything that you can imagine. This is Mustafa. He's 17 years old and he's from Aleppo in Syria. He spent almost two years in Kios as an unaccompanied minor while his family had been accepted in Austria. He was our Arabic teacher and he volunteers wherever he can, helping out with food and clothing distributions and playing with the kids. He's an exceptionally talented photographer. 
He recently had an exhibition in Athens and met with members of the Greek parliament. I told him about today and I said to him, if you could be standing here with me, what would you say? What's important for people to know? He thought about it for a few days and then he sent me a message that said, I would tell them, never judge a book by its cover. There's always something that will surprise you about people. I hate the word refugee because for me in this world, everyone's equal. Refugees can do so much even though they're suffering. Give them help, hope, love and peace and they'll give you the world in return. On my second trip to Kios, the facilities and services for women and children had improved but there was still nothing for men who more and more were becoming the increasing majority, the ones who were left waiting longest because with every boat that arrived, so did more women and children who took priority over them. There are a lot of obvious reasons and conversations why no one had tried a men's centre. I will never forget the day that I got a message from a friend I met on my first trip about coming back to give the Hero Centre and a men's centre a go. You know the kind of people that just make the impossible seem easy. They're brave in that they aren't afraid to fail, so they aren't afraid to try. They say they want to do something and you know it's going to happen. That's Helena, she is a phenomenon. <laughs> she flew back to Greece in March last year and step one was to find a property that would allow refugees. She looked at three, she picked the greenhouse and the Hero Centre was born. A community learning and activity centre exclusively for adult male refugees. A place that they could learn and laugh, relax and spend time with friends somewhere that wasn't a camp. I arrived a few weeks later, and let's just be clear on one thing, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. But it didn't matter. The situation was so overwhelmingly dire that it removed the fear of failure. Any effort was better than none. It was more important to just take that first step and at least try. I remember Helena said to me, if we can watch three movies and not get shut down in the first week, it's a great success. The unique thing about the Hero Centre is that as much as possible, it was run by the guys themselves. It wasn't a volunteer organisation, it was about empowerment over charity. Why buy tables, desks and chairs when there are people who would love to build them? Why employ an electrician when there was probably 50 sitting just down the road in Suda? The day the lights went on and we had somewhere to sit it was a pretty great day. By focusing on empowerment over charity, the Hero Centre was able to give back something that had been taken away in the camps. The power of choice and the ability to make decisions. The guys decided what they wanted to do, what they wanted to learn. They would help us with social media and crowdfunding and we would apply for small grants to make it happen for them. Within reason, Bassam still can't get over the fact that he couldn't open a tattoo parlour in the classroom. But through a lot of generous donations of time and money, we were able to facilitate a lot of things. Everything from language classes, art and sport, to psychology sessions, music, meditation and weekly excursions. One of my favourite memories was on an excursion. The boys were dancing on the beach and an elderly Greek gentleman came up to us. We weren't always met with kindness when we were out, so my instant reaction was one of nervousness but this time I had nothing to worry about. He just loved to dance. He spoke Greek, I spoke English, the boys spoke Arabic, it didn't matter. Dancing is a universal thing, it needs no words. And sitting back, watching them teach him how to dubka and the smiles on their faces was amazing. The embraces as they left gave me a glimmer of hope. We bought a washing machine, which meant finally a place that they could wash their clothes. Friday night, family movie and dinner night was always a highlight. The boys would call their mums and ask for recipes, spend all afternoon cooking up a feast, which they would then proudly serve to their hero centre family, their brothers. Fast forward six months. We'd watched three movies. We hadn't been shut down. But then Suda Camp got decommissioned. It closed down and everyone got moved out to Muddy Vial, a closed military camp 
almost a two-hour walk from town and therefore the Hero Centre. And when that happened, what people needed changed. So the Hero Centre changed with them. First, we evolved into an open house, a hub for health and mental wellbeing. And then the decision was made at the end of last year to close the activity centre so that we could shift our focus and funding to a housing project, providing basic accommodation for vulnerable and otherwise homeless people. When the centre closed, the boys took every single thing that was not bolted down. And then remarkably, yet completely unsurprisingly, they also went through all their own clothing and possessions, and they took it all out to Vial to hand out to the people who were arriving. Even when facing such horrible situations themselves, they still wanted to help people. So it's in their honour that I want to challenge you all today. What would it look like if walking out of here, you chose to do one thing differently? Just one. What would it look like if we all chose to do one thing differently? I truly believe that everyone always has the ability to give or do at least one of three things. You might not be able to go and work in a refugee camp, but I challenge anyone here to not be able to find 20 minutes once a week to go and pick up bread that's been donated and drop it off so that it can be distributed to people who need it. Or go and sit and have a cup of tea with someone so they can practice their English or help kids with their homework. With 168 hours in the week, I believe that we can all find one. Skip one coffee, make your lunch, have one less wine or beer, I know you can. If we all did that, this room alone would be donating $40,000 a month almost half a million dollars a year just on one coffee a week. The impact that that could have is phenomenal. Find a grassroots organisation, one that does direct, tangible work, because their ability to make every dollar extend is truly amazing. I am by no means a better person or more deserving of safety, shelter, food and warmth just because I was born in Australia. I'm not saying it's our responsibility to fix things, but it is our responsibility to empower ourselves with knowledge, to do what we can to overcome fear and hate, to change the conversation by opening our hearts and our minds. It's crucial that we understand just how similar our lives are to so many people who are now faced with the reality of living in a refugee camp, to meet them, hear their stories, see their smiles, just relate, because then maybe, just maybe, we could change a thought, a belief, an opinion, an action. You don't need to know what happens next. You just have to take that first step. The beauty of effort is the path evolves for you. And from little things, big things grow. What started out with a goal of watching a movie and not getting shut down in the first week grew to a Hero Centre family with over 500 men using the centre and now a housing project that so far has put a roof over the head of 53 people. <laughs> we can't help everybody, but everyone can help someone. And I'm really good. And when kids for you, then if you have much... <laughs> so do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. Shukran, Teshakor, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.